This is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast. I'm Ed Robertson. My guest today is Nick Offerman. Nick is an actor, author, humorist, and a woodworker who's best known for playing the legendary character Ron Swanson on NBC's Parks and Recreation. But his success as an actor is just the tip of the iceberg. He's written five New York Times bestselling books, is the narrator of three of Wendell Berry's audiobooks, and owns and operates Offerman Woodshop, where he and a small collective of woodworkers handcraft everything from spoons to furniture to canoes. And as many of you know, Nick is a staunch advocate for conservation, responsible land stewardship, and sustainable agriculture. Nick's most recent book is titled Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, The Pastoral Observations of One Ignorant American Who Loves to Walk Outside. And it's an excellent, thought-provoking read. It follows Nick on a series of adventures through the American West and the English countryside, adventures driven by his desire to better understand conservation, recreation, and humans' connection to the land and wild places. Along the way, he explores everything from the legacies of John Muir and Aldo Leopold to regenerative agriculture, without shying away from tough, complex topics, such as industrial farming and the conservation movement's impact on indigenous cultures. The book also hits on many of the underlying ideas that are often explored here on Mountain and Prairie, including nuance, empathy, compassion, curiosity, and doing work that makes the world a better place. I love the book, and I highly recommend it. I met up with Nick in Los Angeles at Offerman Woodshop, and we had a fun, inspiring, and at times hilarious conversation about everything from Aldo Leopold's land ethic to his work as a, quote, traveling clown. And those are his words, not mine. We started out by discussing the life-changing moment when a friend handed him a Wendell Berry book and how Wendell's writings and philosophy continue to be one of Nick's most important sources of inspiration and instruction to this day. We discuss why hard work and being of service to others is so deeply embedded in Nick's DNA and the critical role that artists can play in solving societal challenges. We talk about authenticity, the importance of being even keeled, the need for nuance and open mindedness, the skill of self deprecation, enjoying the process of creating, not passing judgment, and much, much more. Where the Deer and the Antelope Play was just released in paperback, so follow the links in the episode notes to pick up a copy. And if you're a longtime listener, I know you'll love it. There are also links to Offerman Woodshop, Nick's touring schedule, and all of his other books. So click through and check it all out. A thousand thanks to Nick for inviting me to his shop for such an amazing conversation. And thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy. All right, Mr. Offerman, here we are. Thank you very much. Um, seriously, I, it's just awesome to be sitting here with you. Awesome to see your wood shop in person. And we we share a few mutual friends. And so it's even though it's the first time we met, I feel like I know you. And then after hassling you and, you know, stalkerishly reading your book. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I feel the same. It's it's funny when I hear that from someone like you, because to me, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, be, being accepted into the Konya Senti. <laughs> You're you're the arbiter. You're the hub of all these great minds, all these great books, and here I am, a jackass with like a you know a hiking book with a sense of humor, and I'm just glad that I made the cut. <laughs> barely, you barely made it, well, but we very well may have a contest here of who's the most self deprecating. <laughs> okay. I've been getting a bunch of like aggressive shit recently from people saying you need to stop being so de- self deprecating, and then but you're an expert at it. Well, I mean, I own a mirror is the problem, but let's let's proceed under the the conception that we're terrific. Okay, we'll do that just for the next hour. I can do that. Yeah. Um, trying to figure out how I'm going to start this thing out. And as I was reading your book, I was really struck by so many similarities and how in the way you think about things and the way I think about things. And I I think there's several like foundational things that I think are similar. One, we both hit the lottery when it came to having loving, nice, supportive families. Mm. And then we both grew up in small towns where there was a real sense of community pre internet. And then we both had our lives changed by reading specific books. And so I I know some people that have, that have gone down that path, but you're very, very similar to me in that way. And so I was wondering if you could start out with a story you've told before, but I think it really sets the foundation for this book. 1995, when you were handed a copy of a 
very, very special author. I, I was doing a play at the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, which is about the best theater company in the country. And I, I was very lucky to, to be Ethan Hawke's understudy <laughs> nice. in a production of Sam Shepard's Buried Child, which is a great Pulitzer Prize winning play. And this wonderful actor named Leo Burmester, who's no longer with us, sadly, but a, a, a wonderful, boisterous, uh, uh, bombastic Kentucky son. I don't know, took a shine to me and something about my work ethic around the theater. If you come from a farm, they'll always put you to work because you can sew a button or you can you can hammer a nail or what have you. And so Leo and I took a shine to each other and he just brought me uh, a couple books of Wendell Berry short stories. One one collection was called Fidelity and one was called Watch With Me. And he said, I think, I think he, with a wink, I mean, I mean, like it was Gandalf in disguise where he was like, I think you might like these stories. And I took him home and read them. And I mean, in a nutshell, uh, you know, describe Shakespeare in a nutshell, but in a nutshell, it, it was the reverence that Wendell Berry pays to the simple tactile work of, of human culture. I mean, he describes in one book uh, a farmer and his hired hand building a fence. And he describes it as though it's the most beautiful Russian ballet you've ever seen. And I just immediately, I mean, he had me in tears thinking, he's talking about me and my dad and my family. My mom's whole side of the family are still farmers in Illinois. And all of, all of these people lead these lives of service, and he's elevating them as high as any luminary you could you could come up with. And I think that's right. You know, it was an epiphany for me, like uh, the way he was elevating the every person. And so it, I, it changed, I don't know, it changed my life. I mean, it just it opened my eyes to understanding the, the attention and affection that we need to pay to our farmers and to all of the laborers who, you know, source the raw materials from Mother Nature and provide us with these cushy lives that we lead. And, you know, that we're, we're sort of taught by consumerist channels to forget about. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're told, you just live in your pod, push your buttons, we'll, we'll bring you your smoothies, watch these shows, play these games, you know, and don't worry about, you know, it was like, okay, is, do we have enough power? No, don't worry about it. You know, just keep, send us a check, we'll send you electricity, don't worry about how we get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's something that... That's what I, so that's at the core of what I am, you know, humbly trying to communicate to my audience and my readership is we're all absolute dipshits. Like we're, we're, are, are we incredible? Absolutely. You know, did we produce Beyonce? We sure as hell did. But, you know, did, did we create the Reuben? You're goddamn right we did. There are incredible things we've done, but at the same time, <laughs> are we destroying aspects of our planet and our ecosystem? You bet your sweet bippy we are. And that idea that we've been tricked, and that is a, the farmer in me, in, in my blood, the idea that I'm sending my, my money to the gas company, to the, to the utilities, with the, the sort of tacit understanding, you're going to send me power, and you, I assume you're going to be cool, right? And there's this, you know, there's this understanding of like, well, yeah, just don't worry about it. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, the bill comes to the table, and we're like, Oh shit! They did. Char they charged us for the bread. That, f that fork you dropped. Yeah, they, they charged us triple. Well, one of the things that I th you point out in the book, and it just by the way you write and the way you think about things, became clear to me is there's. It's not like you're coming at it preaching that, you know, any rancher that doesn't do regenerative ag doesn't know what they're doing, or you know, farmers who are working on the industrial scale they don't know what they're doing. It's you come at it with this educational perspective of like, look, there's been plenty of times where I didn't know something and then I learned something. Like I think about where I live in Colorado Springs, nobody understands that there's the water's going to run out one day. Right. And so like when you started reading Wendell Berry, I mean, your parents had been teaching you this stuff all along, but did it just take that kind of different voice for you to to understand it and to really appreciate I, what they were doing? I suppose. And and uh, I just want to point out that in case there's any question that we're in Los Angeles, uh, this, this, soon there will be a chopper <laughs> landing and then the gunshots will begin. Um, I mean, 
My my dad is is one of these guys who he now happens to be the mayor of our small town, Manuka, Illinois, and his his dad had been the mayor before him. But they're very much farmer politicians. Now they they grew up farming, but my dad decided not to continue and he became a school teacher. And my mom grew up on a farm a few miles down the road, and her family's still raising corn and soybeans. And they also had pigs th- through the time that I was in high school. So I grew up working on the family farm, but the son of a nurse, uh, she's a labor and delivery nurse, yep. and dad was a school teacher. And so like my dad is still the most prolific gardener in town. He's the guy who'll leave a box of tomatoes on 18 doorsteps and cucumbers and you name it. Mom and dad both lead exemplary lives of service. My three siblings all live within a block of mom and dad, and they all are the same. They're great citizens trying to off balance the damage that I'm doing uh, to our society. And and so th- they taught me these things, and I had these values in me, frugality and, and thrift and, and work ethic and decency and, and citizenship, but I didn't care about it i didn't like i i was like yeah you what do you what are you little house on the prairie you know i want to be cool i want to go to the city and be in a david lee roth video in a corvette with girls in bikinis and and eventually i got there and it was like i called my dad i got to college one day and called my dad i don't know once the weight of adulthood landed on my shoulders and i realized I had to keep my own checkbook and yeah. now I'm responsible for myself. And I called my dad and said, okay, dad, are you sitting down? <laughs> you were right. Uh, I'm sorry. And I will now, you know, like I'm now going to spend the rest of my life aspiring to do what you've been telling me all along. And so, I mean, you know, cut to, I'm, I'm like, living a hedonistic life in my, I'm in my mid twenties. I'm just a kid. Yeah. And I'm just doing my best to, to participate in this culture of, of storytelling through the theater, through performing narratives. And I don't know. I mean, organically it brought these Wendell Berry stories to me. And it, I guess it was a, it was a combination of the world I was pursuing the the world of, of literature and, and performance conflating with my hometown, you know, shortly after I did that Sam Shepard play, I did an adaptation of William Faulkner's as I lay dying by this great artist named Frank Galati and same thing where it was, you know, it's very much about a dust bowl family and Mm -hmm. it's the, this the same way that, that Chekhov wrote his stories and made them the most beautiful drama and the the highest highs and the lowest lows with the narratives of everyday life, you know, understanding that everybody's stakes, everybody's high stakes are the same. Sure. Whatever reason you're trying to race through traffic and makes you want to cut somebody off here in LA, it's all the same, whether you've got a pregnant lady in the car or you're just trying to like get to a black Friday sale or you name it, or maybe you just have to tinkle real bad. It's, and so it's sort of understanding that great leveling, I don't know, it just it just struck me. And I'm so grateful that ever since then, it's allowed me, it's given me purpose to the things that I create, rather than just trying to get good jobs or, or you know, get an extra BMW in my garage, or, or what have you, you know, I feel very lucky that by my late 20s, I had it pointed out to me that wealth and fame are not satisfying goals. Yeah. Like I, I was lucky enough to, to taste a little bit of those and was like, Oh, this, this is stupid. Like this doesn't feel nearly as good as, as like working hard all day w- with my friends and family. And so I think I'll keep trying to do that. Yeah. I, that comes through crystal clear in everything you write, but just this almost like a responsibility you feel to, work hard. And I, I heard this on the, I think it was when you were on Conan O'Brien and it stuck with me along. I think it was one of your earlier appearances there. And then you mentioned it in, in one of your books where you met your beautiful wife, moved into a nice house and you just like, all right, I got it made. I this made is it. what I've been looking. Can you tell that story? Cause I think that's so telling yeah. of your mindset. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good pull because that's exactly, that's what I just thought of when I said I made 
it made it all the way to the David Lee Roth video with the girls in the Corvette. I made it to Hollywood. I, I, you know, backed into uh, a marriage with, with a legendary and gorgeous performer, Megan Mullally. And we, we met doing a play and got together and, and a few years in bought our first house in the Hills. And one day she went off to shoot Will and Grace and I, we had a little swimming pool and I mean, all of these things, I just giggled as I put Neil Young on the outdoor speakers, which I didn't know were a thing around the pool. And it's his record from, I think, around 72 called Everyone Knows This Is Nowhere. And I, and I smoked a joint and I, and I floated on a thing in the pool and just thought, you, you made it, buddy. You did it. Like, you are so terrific that here you are. And I got through like a song and the second song started and I thought, what are you going to do? Just lay here like an asshole in this pool all day. (laughs) Like you, you should, you could be getting something done. And I just, that's, I mean, I can never thank my mom and dad enough for the knowledge that at the end of the day, if I've gotten some good work done and, and Wendell preaches the same thing, Wendell Berry in his books, if you look around and you see the work that needs doing and you get to doing it, that will solve a lot of your problems. Mm-hmm. If you if you sort of buy into this this modern American dream where you're supposed to get rich enough that you can put your feet up yeah. and just and, and just indulge yourself, that's when you be- then you're like, what's the matter with me? And you and you become too solipsistic. You become addicted to things, and it's because you're not doing anything. Yeah, I mean, it's it. The, he's he writes so beautifully about how we've been sold a bill of goods that hard work is something to be avoided. Getting your hands dirty is somehow beneath us when that's, that's where all the good shit happens. You know, if I have this wood shop, if I become just a gentleman woodworker and I show up in a suit and a fancy car and let my laborers, you know, get dirty, I, I would be tricking myself and mm-hmm. it would be a horrible trick because they would be having all the fun. They'd mm-hmm. be getting to use the chisels and what would I be doing? Like using my my abacus to count all the shekels in my coffer? Throwing money in there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a jumping ahead that that reminded me of a part in the book where the deer and the antelope play, which I want to I want to talk about in detail. But there's a part I think it's in the third section where you're talking about this ridiculous website that I think I've heard podcast ads for called Blinkist, mm. where you can, <laughs> where you can get Jesus books. You can read, quote, quote, read books in 15 seconds. Yeah. And so that goes right along with, I don't understand who would want to do that. I don't fucking get it. Uh, why, why would, I mean, truly, why would anybody do that? It's like if talking about running these long races. If I could run 100 miles in an hour. Right. There's no point in running Which, 100 miles. Exactly. I want to get my ass kicked. Well, it's, I mean, you know, you, you're, you've zeroed in on the, the ethos of my wood shop, you know, Everybody in my life on the business side, my like business, my finance people, for for decades now say this wood shop is great. People love it. Let's and this this will date the conversation, but they'll say there used to be a magazine in the back of every plane seat called Sky Mall no, Catalog, and it was all these products. It was kind of like a sharper image kind of thing, where it was just you know gadgets and and cute gewgaws. And what have you. And like, you know, it's a little magazine stand and we make it in mahogany, maple, walnut and oak. And my my business manager initially was like, man, we we could get you something. You're Mr. Megan Mullally. Like we could we could get a set of coasters in the Sky Mall catalog and then you're set. And I said, Pete, the the whole point of the wood shop is that I and and my cohorts, my my elves get to make things with our hands and that's how we make our money. And that makes a very satisfying life. The more we go into production and it becomes like a factory, then we are not making things with our hands. We're pushing buttons on machines on our chair making machine. And then we sit there and get fat while a robot has all the fun. So the whole ethos is to, is to craft it in a way I'm constantly 
tweaking the experience for my employees to try and give them the best possible living with the best possible benefits while they're still being satisfied rather than just thinking about the bottom line because the that nerve everybody the nerve of you doing that well that's it's that's that's what I, that's what I'm preaching and um I know I'm crazy but you you said something earlier about about that idea that like I count myself among us Americans and us earthlings. And so when I look at industrial farmers, for example, I don't look at them as them. I look at them as us. We all did that. Like over the our lifetimes and before our, our folks' lifetimes, our, our society said, hey, we made way too much corn. What should we do with it? Like all of these things came about as a one-time – good ideas to sure. somebody to some extent. Hey, if we do things this way, we can feed all these people. If we do, you know, and then, and it's like, wow, this is working. Oh shit. Diabetes mm -hmm. or hey, well, this is, oh no, we've, we've ruined the topsoil. You know, we've, we've, we've created microorganism deserts, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, we're all doing this together. If, if when I write about politics, I, you know, I say, look, Here's an example of a guy who I think we can all agree is a real ass wipe. Some of us like that and say, we want the ass wipe. And some of us don't like it for obvious reasons, but it's us. Like we made this government. We, you know, we vote, we campaign. And so, you know, I'm always game to shake hands and have everybody sit down and have a beer rather than like pull out a weapon or even talk about it anything like that. My motto is hug before punch. We're all, we're, it's never going to change that we all have to share what we have here. You know, what, what the creator has provided for us. So let's, even though we're going to piss each other off, let's continue to try and get along. And you know, the, it's, 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 it's a project that will never end because it will always involve human beings. We're never going to be like, well, we did it. <laughs> Everybody's happy. All the systems are sustainable. Go get in the pool. Smoke yeah. a joint. Anybody want some clear drinking water? <laughs> I'll just grab it out of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about the book where the deer and the antelope play because we were talking before we started recording. I said it really could be like the Mountain and Prairie uh, instruction manual for people to read because you talk about conservation from both the Muir side of things and the Leopold side of things. You talk about being humble you know, having a, a sense of humility, being curious, just all these things that are important to me. And I didn't even realize it when I started this podcast, but that's kind of what I'm trying to get at with people. And so for your book, could you talk about how the idea, when you had that conversation with Wendell Berry and he told you, you were talking about conservation and he said, instead of looking through it through this lens, maybe look through it through that lens and how that started. Sure. I mean, I knew ex immediately what, what he meant. And I mean, it, and a lot, you know, a lot of what I've already said, like sort of my soapbox issues dovetail really nicely with your whole trip about the strenuous life. I mean, it, it's, it's that simple. It's like, you're going to be much happier if you get out there and try. And, and what that begs the question at what, what do you mean? Well, look around you, look at who needs what is it your family? Is it your neighborhood? Is it yourself? Who, who needs work to be done? You know, could be childcare, could be cutting people's yards. It could be, you know, it could be becoming an amazing tax preparer. Mm -hmm. There are people that, that love everything. Everybody, I always insist, has, has some great talent. And mine inexplicably, after, after Leo Burmester gave me those Wendell Berry stories, I, as a, you know, a fledgling theater man, uh, I wrote a letter to Wendell Berry and said, Hey, I'm, I'm this jerk in Chicago. Can I adapt one of your stories to the stage or the screen? I don't care which you're just the best writer. I love your stories the most. And I want to tell them to my audience. That's what I do. And he wrote back this great letter. First of all, he wrote back uh, and wrote this great letter that, that said like, I, I like you and I like your letter. The answer is no. I, I, I'm not interested in seeing anybody else's version or adaptation of my work. Once I'm gone, you know, that's fine. And I, and I just shook my head and said, man, now you, you son of a bitch, I respect you even more. And he, and he does it with a sense of humor, you know. So we started sporadically writing letters back and forth. Nothing, I mean, 
very, very much like disciple to guru. He and he was just very generous to always reply. He he writes back to a lot of people, and eventually, but I mean, eventually, my obsession led me to be introduced to a great filmmaker named Laura Dunn. And I got to help her produce this movie about Wendell and his vision called Look and See, yep. which is available on, on channels. And through that, I finally got in touch with with his daughter, Mary, who kind of runs the outfit. She, she's a formidable, a, a wonderful leader, a, a great general of, of the army over there, who's gentle in all the right ways. She, she, she runs their outfit – with an iron hand, but then also turns around and makes a mean chess pie, uh, which I had not heard of before she served it. Eventually, when I got to meet Wendell and, and his amazing wife, Tanya, who, you know, like like any good household, it's, it's not just him. He, she is perhaps the real power center sure. on that acreage. And, you know, got to talking to them, and it comes to pass that his, his son, Den, is a woodworker. And so my letters had never really sparked a lot. I think Wendell gets a lot of of, of solicitation, but I thought mine were like mine were like, dear Mister Barry, I am I am you know decent to skilled in the following: hammer, shovel, <laughs> scythe, you know, chisel. You this this this. I I can I can hold any manner of livestock. I I, I know what side to put the electric fence on. Like you name it. If I could, can I just come work with you for a week? I'd like, and he always answered these things really generously. But then finally, somehow my name came up around this documentary, and his son said, "Oh, I just got the copy of Fine Woodworking magazine that he's on the cover of. Oh, you're in, which is the only one I, that, that I have my own article where I invented a way to flatten a slab for uh-huh. like a table." And I mean, that is crazy serendipity where the fact that I was a woodworker suddenly made me legit. And Wendell said, well, all right, let's have him over on Sunday afternoon and we'll talk to him on the porch. And so once the conversation began, it's just a matter. It's an ongoing conversation. I mean, he and Tanya joke that he's just been writing the same book for 50 or 60 years and putting different covers on it. Because because we haven't listened to him yet, you know? The fact that I have to explain even who he is to most people drives me crazy. It's it like crazy. having to it's like having people me say, I love John Lennon, and they're like, Who? And I've not heard of he <laughs> he writes what now? And so by the time Wendell made this made this sort of suggestion to me, what he was saying was I was to, I was simply saying, I have this idea to try and communicate to my my audience that may not come from rural areas, or even if they do, may not be in touch with their agriculture. It's farmers first, and to my way of thinking. Uh, but then I extrapolate that to the men and women harvesting fish and, and seafood and so forth, and and the people in the timber industry, and just all the people you know culling the natural resources that create these cushy lives that we live. It's, I, I said I wanted to write a book that's about how, you know, tr- just trying to do my part, like, hey, you guys, we should be paying more attention to these systems because the capitalists that are, that are running these systems are rapacious, and we're not paying attention to the fact that they're using up all of our shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's our wall. Like the, the fact, the whole, there's an incredible book called, there's two books. Her, the writer's name is Elizabeth Reut, R-O-Y-T-E. And they're about 15 or 20 years old now. But one is called Garbage Land and one is called Bottle Mania. I think I've seen those. She li- lived in, lives in an apartment in the book. I'm not sure. I mean, her, her kids must be up and grown now, but she it just occurred to her she was helping clean up this filthy canal in the neighborhood of Gowanus the Gowanus canal which that's where i built my first canoe coincidentally in a in a pier in, in red hook and when i got there there was a newspaper at the little cafe it was all very cute it's where on the waterfront was set yeah 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 the hope and anchor was the name of this this cafe and the you know, place across the street you know distilled their own bourbon and rum and so it was, it was a very evocative place to build my first canoe. And I went and ordered 
you know, breakfast at this cafe and the, the local paper, the headline article was some students had just tested the local canal. And if it was a human, it would die of gonorrhea. It was so Damn. gross. And so she coincidentally was out clean neighborhood cleanup of the canal. And it's just really gross and filthy and just full of all kinds of, of bad things. And she just thought, where is this coming from? Is it, yeah. like there's there's garbage, there's needles, there's but there's also just like sewage. Mm-hmm. And is is any of this coming from me? My apartment is five blocks away or whatever. And so, as a journalist, she said, "Huh, that's a great book idea." So she wrote this book, tracing everything that left her apartment. Yeah. Two young parents and a kid, I believe. So sewage, garbage, and recycling. Uh-huh. And, you know, as you can imagine, it's, it's really uh, educational, but it's also terrifying and depressing. The fallacy of our recycling systems, the simple fact that the Pepsi bottling company invented the three arrow recycling symbol. I did not know that. So that they could, they, I think it was in the late seventies and it's been a while. So please don't fact check me, but, or, or do, but, but they invented that because they were, they realized since they started plastic bottles, they are no longer selling you Pepsi or soda pop. What they're selling you is plastic bottles. Uh, and it doesn't matter what's in the bottle. The profit comes from the bottles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're, but, but people didn't want to buy them because we use glass bottles because we're good citizens, like, like a lot of Europe. And, and we return them for a deposit. And they said, how can we get these suckers to buy these bottles? And they invented the recycling symbol. And they were like, it's cool. I should have known that. We recycle these. Now, it's been a while, but I don't believe that's apocryphal. And so this was a very inspiring book. And for her as well, it led her to then write her next book, Bottle Mania, about plastic bottles and the bottled water industry and how Nestle, for example. Do you have Ozarka in Colorado Springs? I don't. Maybe so. Around I've, around the sorry, around the country, whatever the biggest bottled water label is. Yeah. Here it's Arrowhead. Okay. In in the in New England, it's Poland Springs. Yeah, I've seen that. There's Ozarka. I forget what it is, but it's it's every single one of them is Nestle. And so she goes on this deep dive in the town of Poland Springs, Maine, where Nestle owns the motherfucking aquifer. They own the groundwater. And it's a there will be blood thing where it's like their milkshake, their straw, they have the longer straw. So there's been, and again, this I'm not sure where things stand because this book is 15 years old, but it it begs the question, what if they do that with our air? Like, like they're... You know, a corporation Mm -hmm. is sucking the groundwater out and selling it back to us. Yeah. (laughs) What's the matter with us? Well, they're doing that in Colorado right now, too. All all over. Everywhere. It's crazy. And so it's just recognizing these things that, that, like, it blows me away. I I travel like crazy because I'm a touring clown. And so I do my best. It's hard. I mean, you can't can't be – if you, like – touring clowns or rock and roll bands, you have to understand that they're going to burn fuel. And it's some there, you know, there are many things that those are, those also keep me humble where I'm never going to get preachy because I, I burn as much gas as anybody. Well, that goes the nuance you're, you're talking about, you know? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're all human. And, and so it, it's better to have the conversation and recognize our, our foibles than like make it binary and, 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 you know, become preachy. But one little thing that I do, I have these water bottles that we sell at Offerman Woodshop. It's a Nalgene, you know, uh, like 32 ounce water bottle. And this cool kid, actually it was the teenager. It was the son of former podcast guest and proprietor of Fort Lonesome chain embroidery systems and artistry in Austin, Texas, Kathy Sever, who, who I, I'm besotted with her and her husband, Matt, the electrician. Do you yes, know his stuff? I do. I support him on Patreon. I'm a big fan. His song, the bear could be the theme song of, uh, of your podcast, but I was playing, I love playing this great theater in Austin, the paramount. Um, and I was really excited and, and Matt and Kathy were coming and they were bringing their teenagers who are these really cool kids. Sound cool. Now they're young adults. And after the show, 
and I, I believe uh, their son's name is Arlo. They came downstairs to the dressing room after the show, and I was all excited to sort of. I love when a te- I can get a teenager to give just even give the slightest shit about anything that I do, <laughs> because you know, the, the, like the, they're our hope. I believe they are our future. That's a figure of speech that you can attribute to me. I believe they are our future, comma the children. <laughs> So I come downstairs and Arlo has got this frown on his face and uh-huh. we've just, we've just blown the roof off this place with 90 minutes of laughter and stupid songs. And I, and I say, Hey, what'd you think? And he said, Pfft. and I said, what, what, what is the matter? And he said, well, you, you know, you have all of these, this messaging about like caring about natural resources and, and making things with your hands. But the entire time, leading up to your show before you came on while we're listening to your pre-show playlist on stage is just a single down spotlight with a stool and a huge bottle of Fiji water. Mm. You piece of shit. Like he was so He's mad a, at me. That's bold. I'm impressed. And I shook my head and shook his hand and said, Arlo didn't even think of it. Thank you so much. Like you. And from that day forward I've used, and that was probably I don't know, eight years ago, I've used, I'm responsible for maybe 10 plastic bottles since then. I would, he, well, he kicked me in the balls. I mean, and I, I said, that's ridiculous because we have all become inured. And now it makes me so mad when every time the reason I mentioned touring is because I get on an airplane and at every seat, they have a little, they have a little like six or eight ounce bottle of water. So silly. And I'm and I'm just like, what? We've all just accepted this. We've all accepted this dissemination of of oil based plastic bottles. And I'm like, look, I we're all fucking up left and right, yeah. day in and day out. We got a lot of problems to solve. Uh, Greta will tell us, you know, she has a list. But the one thing I can do is I'm going to carry this water bottle with me. And I'm so gratified that all over the the world in airports. Now you can fill your water bottles. They have those cool things and they, they have a little light that tells you if the filter is clean, which in L at LAX, it's always red (laughs) and everyone just fills it anyway. Cause you're like, well, (laughs) what am I going to do? Yeah. I'll sacrifice my lungs for the planet. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's like the, uh, the guy who started Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard, you know, he, he just, he takes your approach where right up front, he says, the planet is worse because of our business, but that doesn't mean we're not going to try to make things a little bit better. And then the the thing about Arlo pointing out that water bottle to you, that's an example we were talking about earlier. It's like, you just hadn't thought about it. It's not yeah. like you're some jerk who's like hell bent on supporting well, Dasani. No, and nobody is. That's the thing. Yeah, nobody yeah. is. And that's why your book, that's one of the things I loved about your book is that you present things that I bet a lot of people don't know anything about. Not because they're dumbasses or they're, they're tearing up the environment, just because people are busy we all got our heads in this Niagara Falls of information. Sure. I mean, you're trying to raise a family and, and the systems, you know, the, the systems that we've all agreed to, to live in are telling you, go to this store, eggs are cheaper. Go to this gas station, go to this, you know, my uncles who are the farmers who are heroes to me. I mean, they're like a couple of Han Solos and their families. Yeah. Like I, I, I'll never again mention farmers without mentioning farmers' wives and farmers' kids. And farmers' dogs, for that matter, but like because it's always a team. It's you know, and and but my uncles and their and their families, all they're doing is like doing their best to provide a good living for their families, raising corn and soybeans to to meet the standards and the price that the market is demanding. That's it. And you know, they they don't have time to read Michael Pollan books and say, wait, should we be planting row crops? Like, you know we've come through decades and generations of like really conservative and frugal living and we're, we're prospering because of it. And now you're telling me what switch it up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, all they know is what's on the chart down at the elevator in town where you haul your truckloads of beans. Yeah. And, And I mean, and these are huge heroes in my life. And so it's something that's that's going to be very incremental, and you know the society's waking up. Climate change is helping to send up the red flags, 
and you know there there are are people that it, it behooves them to say oh that's a hoax for political reasons or financial reasons meanwhile you know towns that are being swept away by floods and fires are like we we beg to differ <laughs> you know <laughs> and we we can't help it it's like i always say i mean we're, america will 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 sit up and pay attention when the air conditioner shuts off for the last time. We're like, oh, what now? Oh, shit. They, I, they were right. I wonder about that. So I wonder about even that sometimes, though, because after COVID, I think it became clear during COVID how quickly we can adjust mm-hmm. to anything. It's like our best, it's our best trait as a species and our worst. Like sure. you think about the obesity epidemic and how, what is it? 50% of Americans are not just fat, obese yeah. and everybody, you know, there's a great pill you can take that'll help or the, you know, the, the healthcare businesses are making a ton and humans just deal with it. And with COVID, we got real used to sitting at home by ourselves and wearing masks and doing all the stuff that you had to do during COVID and it just became the norm. Sure. And so sometimes I wonder like, what if, what if a big portion of LA just gets wiped out by a fire? Will people wake up or will they just be like, nah, well, I guess we got to deal with it. I mean, yeah, it's it's a great question, and it, it's what I love about that Pixar movie, Wall-E, about the oh, yeah, the yeah, robot. Yeah. The it, it, it's a great encapsulation of this narrative where all the humans have just become fat and and baby like, floating around in chairs, and and everything they eat is a smoothie, and suddenly they get into trouble and they're under attack, and they're like, "Holy shit, do, do we remember how to fly this thing?" and and the resilience of you know of humanity, at least in that story, has a happy ending. But I, you know, it would be nice if we could <laughs> if we could clean up our mess before it comes to that. Mm-hmm. One of the things, you know, when you're talking about this, is serious stuff, and in the book, the way you write about it, very serious. But it's not at all. You're not. You don't come off as just like. It furious, pissed off everybody who's not, who doesn't see this sucks or what, you know, you're, 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 you've still got a lighthearted approach to it. Is that just your nature to, to, to be able to kind of keep it between the lines and not just get, cause I'm always, I get real mad about stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, but that's not productive. And it's, I feel like you, it's not, I mean, it's just a waste of complete waste of time. Whose mind are you going to change when you're yelling at them? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's, I, I come by it honest. I can't, you know, it's like, um, I didn't think about it and, and think, well, I'm going to be more even keeled. When I was in high school on my football team, I was the head hunter. Like I was the hardest hitter for the, you know, a couple of years. Like, so I come, I, there are parts of me, what I mean to say is that, that come from a very masculine place. And I'm often accused of masculinity, uh, especially what, people that have enjoyed parks and recreation. And I do, I'm a woodworker and I, I you know, I'm st- strong and capable and I I love to cook meat and and smoke it and so forth and all these things. But my disposition, I don't come from an old fashioned world where that's particularly manly. I just think that's, uh, I've I've written or said in my show, like if, if, if you think pissing heroically, taking a punch and being able to chop firewood makes you manly. I have two sisters that would beg to differ with you <laughs> who can beat the crap out of me and who are perfectly, you know, lovely light. One's a librarian, one's a school teacher. But inst- so all, all of those, those things, I don't know. I absolutely. Do they make me angry? Sure. I mean, I, I have human weaknesses and many things make me fighting mad, but I generally am able to take a deep breath and, and, and you know, instead of like, leaning into stereotypical or or pattern behavior when masculinity is brought into it for example i'll say why why do we have to put a gender on things like that's such an old-fashioned trope you know like going hunting for example and suffering some cold that's that's not manly that's just tough yeah and i know you know and then like cooking the, the most beautiful, delicious, dainty cupcakes. That's not feminine. That's just delicious and like dainty. But I, th- I have both of those in me. I, I will make the cupcakes and then I'll take them on the hunting trip yeah. or like, and everybody is a, is an absolute rainbow of all these human aspects. And so when, when, when things make me mad, I absolutely have the same weaknesses as anybody where I'm like, Ugh. But I generally, maybe it's because 
I've been somewhat visible to, to an extent sure. from a lot of my adult life. And so I know to like take a breath or count to 10 or step outside before sending that tweet or whatever. I mean, and, and so for better or worse, I'm able to take a breath and either, and, and I'm lear- I learn this every day over and over again, either ignore it and don't engage in, in the world of like short attention span, you know, tempest in a teapot. Or if I do engage, try and come back with a sense of humor to not only try and assert my side of things of like, I don't know, you guys, what, what if we, what if we're decent to all the people? What, what about that? But also try and do it in a way that's not incendiary. That's, you know, mm-hmm. that hopefully, and that's what I try to do with my books. I'll, I'll never be a great journalist or scholar, I, I am a voracious student. I love devouring the, the subjects that I love. And I love then trying to regurgitate those in a positive way so that hopefully others and, and maybe even others that are way smarter than me will be like, oh, right. This dumbass who was on TV wrote this book that I read and it gave me an idea to actually do some really smart stuff, <laughs> you know, it, whether it's in agriculture or it's as Wendell Berry puts it and, and Aldo Leopold and, and, you know, all, all of that cadre of great agrarian thinkers, it's, it's all, you can't, you can't separate any of it. It's all connected. All of our, all of our social problems and all of our environmental problems and all of our financial problems are, are all attached to how we relate to our natural resources and the, the attention we pay to them or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. So speaking of that and of being able to kind of regurgitate these great ideas in a way that makes it easy for somebody like me, maybe some of my favorite books are books like yours where it introduces me to a new idea and then it makes me want to go buy about 10 new books. Yeah. And I feel like your book is, is that in a million different ways. For people, I mean, I think most people who listen to my podcast are familiar with Aldo Leopold, but they may not, I, for the longest time, I didn't know anything about him. And, you know, this is a guy working in conservation. So can you just give a brief sketch of how that name kind of came into your mind and, and what it means to you? Wendell Berry uh, speaks uh, of learning so many things from Aldo Leopold, or, uh, Leopold being among the great teachers of, of Berry's life. And he also writes like introductions for Aldo Leopold stuff. So Aldo Leopold grew up in Iowa and was just fascinated with the natural world, what we wanted to be, what they used to call a naturalist. And at the turn of the 20th century, I believe, they, they started the first school of forestry at Yale, and he was recruited to be in the first or second class of that. And from there, they immediately sent him to New Mexico, like, like okay, you're ready. And he, he went out to work for the government in New Mexico and I guess what became the Department of Forestry and, and you know, what became the these departments that we know and love of, of like BLM and yep. and what have you. And so he, you know, worked as, as an agent of the government tending to nature in New Mexico and and just, you know, was thrown into the deep end and began learning with with his colleagues. For example, they began exterminating apex predators yeah and he, he he has a beautiful piece that is is probably his most well-known piece of writing about shooting a wolf and coming to understand that that mankind is being a terrible narcissist when he does things like that it's it's rachel carson does a great job also when she describes people decide to like wipe out a certain bug in a lake in California. And they're like, great, we'll use DDT and we'll kill off this bug and it's going to make everything so much nicer. Well, they, they do, they kill the bug and then all the fish eat the poison bugs and they all die. And then all the birds eat the poison fish and they all yeah. die. So within one season, they just turn it into a, a wasteland of, of toxicity on the same level, Leopold kind of realized this and and just became an absolute wizard of of, of agrarianism. He and he just wrote his most famous piece of writing is this book of essays called the Sand County Almanac, and all all based on the precept that once again that you can't you can't pick out any any one part of nature without affecting the rest of it. You know that it, 
nature needs every cog, even even the parts that we don't know what they do. That doesn't mean they're worthless. Yeah. They're all there because Mother Nature has spent eons figuring out how this machine works. And so far be it from mankind in our hubris to be like, well, I don't like that frog. It's loud. So let's get rid of them. And suddenly the ecosystem collapses, you know. Read this quote in the famous Nick Offerman voice. I, I got that from your book. All right. I'll, I'll have to warm up my, if you want the famous Nick Offerman voice. <laughs> get it, get it ready. Here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> I don't. I don't LA often. Water. I don't often get asked. Read this in your famous voice. <laughs> <laughs> if it's okay with you, I'll just. I'll just use my normal voice. Well, okay. <laughs> this is from Aldo Leopold. All ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise: that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in that community, but his ethics prompt him also to cooperate, perhaps in order that there may be a place to compete for. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants and animals, or collectively the land. Pretty badass. Very badass. And you, you've you narrated a bunch of Wendell Berry's audiobooks, including three. his newest. Th uh, three. Correct? Uh, yeah, I would. Three, not a bunch. I, I, I wish it were a bunch. I, I hope before I'm done to do his whole catalog, although he's very persnickety about having a Kentuckian, and maybe he should be. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know. I dabble in doing a little. I can do a. I can do a, a passable Wendell. I'd have to. I'd have to do some studying to do an accurate job of all the voices in his fiction. Oh, sure. sure. But I've, I'm, I'm very proud. I mean, in the documentary, look and see. Yes. He says something very profound about uh, the the filmmaker asks him in an interview. You know, we live in a in a time of divorce. We like. I feel like we live in modern America where things things are coming apart more than coming together. And, and, and Wendell said, well, yes, but, but that's why, that's why it's important to have artists, people who see two things, not all things, but see two things that they think ought to be put together and they put them together, whether, whether they're writing a symphony or making a film or, or writing a novel or building a stool mm -hmm. The, you know, we are the people who see, who create, and we see that's the work to put things together. And so she asked me if I would build a stool, a little three-legged stool, yeah. to, to 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 show on the screen while he's saying this gorgeous quote. And I burst into tears and was like, and and so in the movie, it's just my hands and tools making this walnut stool, and I don't think I'll ever have a piece of film that I'm more proud of. And also commensurately, I, I get to read two books of his essays, his sort of his big hit, his white album, The Unsettling of America. Yes. And then uh, A World Ending Fire, which is a, another incredible book of essays. And then his most recent, The Need to Be Whole. And I mean, getting to just participate, it's, it's kind of crazy because when I first wrote him uh, almost 30 years ago, when he when he refused to allow me to adapt his stuff, he said, "Well, just write your own, you know, write your own stories." I said, "Well, I I could, but I'm not you. Like like I I'm proven to be competent at at, at disseminating great writing yeah. to people. You are, it's you know, writing great writing is your thing. Can't we get together?" <laughs> And so even so, even then, I was saying, please, just let me participate. Let me be part of the delivery system in getting your words to more people. And so the fact that then 25 years later, I get to do the audio books of, of, his, of his incredible essays is profoundly moving. And I'm, I'm really grateful. And it's, it's the greatest responsibility I've ever felt, I think, in working in the arts is like trying to get this right. Sure. Because like I said, you know, this, this is going to hopefully reach the, the exact 20 or 30 young women or men that are going to solve a lot of problems. How do you think about 
authenticity? Because I feel like you in, in everything you do, whether it's your writing or your acting, you know, or your woodworking, it's very clear when Nick Offerman's doing something, it's Nick Offerman. But in the case of Wendell Berry, that you're just the vehicle, you know, and so it's it's Wendell Berry's words that are coming through you. And so like when you were, say, in in high school or in your early days in Chicago, were, do you feel like you were being the authentic version of yourself or is that has that developed over time with confidence, with success, that kind of thing? I think the parts of me as a teenager and in my 20s that would make people laugh and the parts that worked hard at labor. I think those were those were the building blocks of being, you know, whatever my authentic self is, uh, which feels gross. But like, you know, when I was, as I was developing my brand, <laughs> <laughs> the first first goes at first at the lard. Um, but I, I can tell you a couple things. One was I never knew I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I knew I enjoyed entertaining people. I knew I enjoyed playing music as I as I was like picking where to go to college. And in my senior year, English class, Mr. Luther, for our final exam, we had to write an essay. And he took a poem and taped it up on the wall in front of the class with a piece of masking tape. And I couldn't tell you what the poem was, but he said, this is your subject. Uh Uh Read a thing. And I just had the idea. And I was a good student. I was, you know, uh, one of the top in my little you know, a little high high school, but I was also a smart ass. And I I was always balancing the two seeing like how much I could get away with while still succeeding. And so it just occurred to me, I just had this idea and I just, I made up this essay about the history of masking tape and it was funny. And I, I, I talked about some, you know, local tribe and, and applying pine pitch to birch bark and, you know, early tape basically and how they developed packaging and, and so forth. It w- it was very much thinking outside the box and it could have gone one of two ways. And it, it, he celebrated it. He held it up in front of the class and, and said, this is all I've, I'm ever trying to get any of you to do is think for yourself and have an idea. And he, and he, you know, he had me like read it to the school at an assembly or whatever. And, and so that was a huge feather in my cap where I was like, okay, when correctly applied your smart assery, you, you like the teacher in junior high that said, what are you going to get a job someday as a smart ass? By God, I am Mrs. <laughs> Flatness. I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> And all your square cohorts. And so that was a big moment. And then, and then actually, I went through five years of theater school and into Chicago for a couple of years before I figured out how to bring whatever my authentic self is, how to bring it to my acting. Uh-huh. And so I didn't do well. I couldn't get cast because I was, I was trying too hard to be something that I thought I, that was better than me. Yeah, I was yeah. like, well, I'm just some dipshit from Manuka. Who cares about me? I need to be way cooler. And so I was trying way too hard to be some cool version of, you know, something that eventually I the same part of me that learned life in a David Lee Roth video is not one to be sought after. And so at some point, right in my mid twenties, it finally just dawned on me what Ringo is talking about in the song, just act naturally. And I was like, Oh, if I just act like myself, people are really responding Mm -hmm. in a way. And that was the beginning where my best friend, Joe, who was the director of our theater company, he was finally gave me my first lead role. And he was like, that's it. Just act like yourself. And that was the beginning of, you know, a lifetime of, of craft that is still a learning process. It, that's one of the wonderful things about life as a human being is if you understand that we're never done learning for me as an actor or a woodworker or a writer or a husband or a maker of sweet love, <laughs> there will always be higher pinnacles. You know, there will always be, you know, more, more trails to explore. And that's what makes life worth, worth living. That's what makes me get up in the morning is, is having improvement to find. And so also with my books, if you ever write a book, I, I say to your audience, you'll learn a couple things. One is you're never done writing it. Like you're never, you're never like there. 
all 322 pages are perfect. Like you could keep editing your book or your mov- movie or your song. Yeah, you name it. And so at some point you and your editor are like, okay, that's it. <laughs> and, and, and so you have to understand that. So there's immediately humility baked into that where it's like, look, I did my best. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. I could have tried fixing it for another year, but I, I wanted to get it to you because it's, it's kind of timely. And, and the same is true of, of so much of what we do. And so that I think is the answer to your question is that like, at some point I became okay with, with for better or worse with the package that I've been given where yep. I'm like, okay, look, I'm never going to be the cutest or the, the fleetest of foot or this or this or this, but I am the most Nick Offerman. Mm-hmm. And, and so if I just, you know, deal with, with things earnestly, it's funny. I mean, ever since I got to LA, I would be in conversations with people and I would just be talking to them. Yeah. And whatever my, my my timbre or my my cadence, people would laugh as though I, I was Garrison Keeler or something, and they would say, "Are you a stand up?" And at the time, I would be offended because I didn't even know enough about comedy. I would think of like Rodney Dangerfield, sure, where I'm sure. like, "No, I'm a, I'm a I'm a super cool modern actor from Chicago." Like, you know, I've worked at Steppenwolf, you asshole. <laughs> Little did I know that meanwhile, the coolest standups are all like working, you know, down the street in LA. And eventually I I learned that and, and, you know, learned to look up to them. And now people say, are you a standup? And I say, no, I'll never be as great as Uh our standups, but I am a, I am a humorist. And, and I, I figured out how to make an audience laugh without writing too many jokes. I've written, I've written two jokes in my career and I, would you like to hear them? Yes, I would. I mean, I've been touring for like 12 or 13 years and I really look up to like Zach Galifianakis as a buddy, Sarah Silverman, like these great standups who are geniuses at writing jokes, not me, but I wrote a joke in a show called full Bush and the joke went like this. So, you know, there's these, these dating apps on our phones. You've heard about these things. There's, there's grinder for gay men. There's Tinder, which is, which is for uh, most people. There's that new one for farmers called attractor, which, which did very well. That joke played very well. And then I recently wrote one when people talk about this episode of, I did this episode of a show called the last of us on HBO that was explosively received. It's, it's a, it was a great show. It was kind of like game of Thrones level, like fandom and, and the, the creator and writer, Craig Mazin, who also did the show Chernobyl, who just is obviously a genius of entertainment. So he wrote this script and he's amazing. And, and I was lucky enough to get to play one of the roles. And it's a guy who's like a prepper survivalist. And then he ends up having a love story. But but the whole beginning of it is establishing him and his him like building his survivalist world, okay, yeah. which involves a lot of labor and like building fence and like building booby traps uh-huh. and, you know, harvesting and processing a deer and gardening and, you know, you name it, like yeah. building and like all all of the aspects of survival. And so the show was so well received that that I had to sort of develop a pattern to say thank you. I'm so grateful I got to be in it. It's the best script I've ever been handed. And and then eventually I wanted to say something funny and it took me a while to workshop this and <laughs> the joke I came up with was I just feel very lucky they needed a guy who could use a shovel because there's only 3 of us in Hollywood. And Harrison Ford passed, and Jane Lynch was uh, was already booked. <laughs> yeah, and it's it took, good. And it took me like three months to write that joke. <laughs> so, but but luckily, I I can for some reason the particular way in which I speak slowly makes people laugh, and and so for and I also write and perform stupid songs. Come to Colorado. I know you have in the past. You need to get it on the next on I, the schedule. I, I, I will. I, I've really enjoyed playing also the Paramount in Denver. I've had, I've had a really good time there, and I've done some book events in Fort Collins as, oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've, I, I feel so lucky that I, that I get to do these things because all I'm trying to really do is engender a conversation, and, and, and the fact that I get, I get paid handsomely – 
to sell books or to to travel and you know sing you a song about using a handkerchief or my my new song is about eating ass <laughs> it it's it's going over big time you know? <laughs> how long did that take people so- are finding it very palatable um, <laughs> Was that faster than the joke writing process? It was, yeah. I mean, A B rhymes. When I when I found out that people will will like properly metabolize my stupid jokes through A B rhymes, I was like, well, I'm, guess what? I'm a humorist. Here we go. <laughs> because I'm, my musicianship is perfectly medium. Like, but but it the delivery system works where they laugh at at my dumb things. I wrote, I wrote a song a, called the Rainbow Song for my wife. And it starts with like, you read me my rights when you arrested me. You put me on trial and gave me life. But orange, you glad I didn't say banana when you made me your bitch and I made you my wife. <laughs> Beautiful. And I mean, people really enjoy it. And, <laughs> and I'm very grateful. And so, you know, I love that I get to, uh, I don't know, as a great lover of people and like, civilization. I love that I get to travel and and shake hands with people all over the world. And usually if they show up, especially to book events, it's people that are, you know, that want to think the same way. We shake hands and take each other's measure and say, all right, let's, let's agree at least this far mm-hmm. to, you know, stop putting a bottle of Fiji water on our stool on stage. Well, that fits right in in your book. You're all, you're talking so much about good work. That's what you you know the, the importance of good work and how you just want to do good work, and you want to help people and you want to make people's lives better through everything you're doing. And that's kind of what you're even the tax preparer could want that. Oh yeah. And I think that's just so noble. And when I finally, when I think about my own professional journey, when I finally quit focusing on myself, I mean, you know, I got responsibilities. I got two kids, you know, wife, the whole deal. But tried to make what I was doing a little bit bigger than just lining my bank account. Yeah. That's when things started working. It was the strangest thing. It's, it's, I mean, it's what it's, it's really what it's all about. I have been lucky enough to play at a lot of colleges and I mean, colleges, when I learned that, you know, the student body has like a entertainment committee or something and they get together and they have a budget and, and once a semester they get to pick somebody and sometimes they pick me. And I mean, how can how can you not How cool is that? Just be incredibly grateful and and like want to bust your ass and and instead of show up and and be cynical and like, you know, mm-hmm. roll your eyes at these kids, I young people have chosen me to to entertain them and and you know, maybe they understand that I sneak a little broccoli into the pizza. And and so with that in mind, I mean, I say to them, listen, the best advice I can give you is whatever you're here at school doing, just try and figure out what you love to do with your time and then try and figure out some way to get paid to do that. Whatever it is. I mean, if you love birds, maybe, you know, maybe you go to work for Audubon, but uh, maybe, maybe you work for a publishing company that does nature books or the, the you know, the, the possibilities are limitless, but that's what it's, what the hell is the point of living? Like if, 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 if you're, if you're going to end up, you know, at a, in a cubicle or at a desk that you don't want to be at, then you're, you're trapped. And, and so I'm very grateful. I mean, when I, when I graduated from, from my high school and, and got into a a great theater program at the university of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, that was the first time in college that I said, holy cow, I want to stay up all night and ace yeah. these classes. I want to be the top of my class. I found it. I found the thing that I want to be a master of and just do the best I can. And, men, and many of us, when we find that, even then, we might not get to end up getting cool parts in plays in Chicago. Yeah. Maybe I'll end up running a scenery shop, which I almost did. Or maybe I'll end up running the box office of a theater. But whatever it is, you're not there to like crank out the most cash soaking people for theater tickets. You're there in the service of putting people in front of great storytelling, which is which is medicine. Yes. And so for for what it's worth, all the things that I am involved with, and I think that's I think that's the epiphany that hit me. It's that at the root of what we're talking about when I read those Wendell Berry stories. 
what the, the universe said to me was, here is the medicine that you can spend the rest of your life engaging in, you know, in this book. I mean, I'm about to go back and visit my cows. I, 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 I met uh, an English shepherd on Twitter and went to visit his family in, in on their farm in, in remote Northwest England in the Lake District. Fe- just immediately said, "I am now in your family. Uh, you're <laughs> welcome to." And they and we all agreed, like you're now in our family. I can show up there anytime. I sleep. They have a, a nice, comfy little apartment off their sheep barn, and whatever the time of year, they know. I just want to get up and farm with them. Just go. And for some reason. He he's an incredible writer. He has two great books: "The Shepherd's Life" and "Pastoral Song." And uh, his wife Helen, she has an incredible new book that that just came out called "The Farmer's Wife." That will not. You should get her on your podcast, yeah. and I'm, I'll be happy to introduce you. I'd love it. This book and all of the stuff we love. It, I almost I'm about to start crying thinking, thinking about how it made me feel. You told me that. That's that's what. That's what started this, I think, is you reached out to tell me about that book. That's right. That's right. And um, I, I really, yeah, I mean, I'll take your recommendations all day. And so, I mean, inex- like impossibly. I, I'm, I'm a kid from Illinois. Now I live in California. And suddenly I own a dozen belted Galloway cows in Northwest England because I share their obsession for grass-fed beef and rotational grazing and understanding like reworking the the soil health and and the the incredible benefits of of the carbon sink things that are happening like with white oak pastures in Georgia yeah, yeah. or Joel Salatin or all all of these great stories of of like look we're going to just try doing what Aldo Leopold is talking about what what Wendell Berry is talking about it's not. It's nowhere near a, a repeatable paradigm. Like we can't just suddenly shift everybody. Mm-hmm. But th- this is the way forward. It's clearly the way forward. Like we, we've destroyed so much of our topsoil in this country, and here are these incredible experimenters just going backwards, just yeah. saying, "Well, I think people used to get along with Mother Nature. In fact, they sort of made that one of their mission statements. Was like, well." Our tribe wants to live here, hopefully forever. So how can we get our clothing and food in a way that our generations to come can, you know, and let's call that sustainability. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, you know, I, I get to like, go see this wonderful family. I get to travel with Megan, my wife to, to parks, you know, and, and to the Berry farm and, they have uh, a Wendell Berry farming program. Yep. They also have a they have their own beef pro- program called Our Home Place Beef, which yep. you, wherever you are, you can order it. You can get it shipped in. Although, event, which is great, but eventually, let's get everybody doing this locally, so we don't. It's ter- like I don't ever want to get a steak through the mail again. I mean, I love it. I love supporting these programs, but everyone should have this down the road. Like, if you can't if you can't get amazing eggs. Then become your local purveyor of eggs. It's sure. not that tough, you know. I just really admire that you're so passionate about because, you know, it's just built into your DNA. But really, at, at this point, you could be the guy sitting in the pool and listening to Neil Young, and you choose to devote your energy. And we were talking about schedules before we started recording, and I mean, you got a lot going on. And so the fact that you write these books, talk about these issues, you know, engage with people on the ground doing the work, participate in it. I mean, it's, it's so inspiring. And I think anybody, and I used to be this guy, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. You're never too busy. You can figure out times to, I mean, uh, well, when you're, sure. when you're in, when you're assuming your needs are met and that you can pay the bills and that kind of thing, like you're at a certain level of privilege, there's time to be made. There is. And I, I, now here's where I'll, I'll stop, uh, our, our earlier agreement that we're both terrific because <laughs> I, you know, I come from a family of, of just, uh, uh, of the right kind of Christians. My mom and dad are, are probably parishioners one and two in our, in our Catholic church. And me and my siblings left the church and, and are all, I, I think I can safely say we're all atheist, but we're all very spiritual. Like, 
are you know what what you could describe as actual Christian values, which you don't see in a lot of modern Christianity, brand name Christianity, are incredibly important to us. I mean, we we lean on ourselves and what we learn from our mom and dad to lead lives of service or to or to treat everyone decently as best we can, and so. I'll always be very aware of of the incredible life of luxury that I live, and I'll never live up to my mom and dad's example of of living lives of service. But but you know, getting to engage in this in this medicine delivery system helps a lot. Instead of you know collecting cars or yeah. you know like just doing something that that that's just material and. I don't know. It's it's a great blessing when you understand. And again, from my family taking like really frugal Minnesota fishing cabin vacations and learning at those what a good time and how much love and affection you can share for for no money. You know, if you got a deck of cards and a case of beer and uh, and a grill and a boat, you're you're set. Like you you will be as happy as any king. And or probably happier, happier, yeah. You're right. um, and, and so I'm so grateful for that knowledge because that that means that I don't make decisions based on like hoarding wealth or ambitions of like trophies or you know l- life goals. When people ask me, "Is there a role you know you'd love to play or any?" I, I never think about, and I say, "No, I don't." Because here's the thing, the things that have been the best for me, I never could have thought of. Yeah. If I was like, well, sure, I'd love to play old Superman. (laughs) I mean, only if some great writer, some great artist knows what to do with me as old Superman, Uh because I don't. Like, I never could have come up with the things that have served me the best as an actor. I never could have thought those up. So that frees me. Sure. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. And so I can, and so I can go to my wood shop or, or I can write a book or I can go on tour with my dumb songs waiting in, you know, in the hopes that some great artists will want me to come do their version of old Superman. (laughs) (laughs) I talked to people this the other day when I was in, it was like 20 years ago, but there was a guy that I worked with when I was in a cubicle at Merrill Lynch. Mm. I said, I won't say his name. I said, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? He said, I'm going to the movies. I said, well, what movie are you going to see? And he said, (laughs) Spider-Man. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've never heard that. It's like Batman, Superman, Iron Man. All things exist in this universe. (laughs) And now I've heard (laughs) Spider-Man like Bellman. Isn't that funny? It's funny because Megan always, I, I have a weird thing because I come from a cultural vacuum. And I don't mean that as an insult. Growing up in a tiny Illinois farm town in the 70s and 80s, we just didn't have like we, you know, we had like the three primetime channels and top 40 radio. And so I gleaned a lot of the world through reading. Yes. And I think a lot of people can relate to this even now. Well, maybe not because people because of the movies, but like Lord of the Rings, for example, I I, I lived on and, and, and the Chronicles of Narnia and, and other sci-fi and fantasy. And then eventually when people began to make movies or it became, you know, part of the zeitgeist and they would pronounce Legolas wrong. Whereas like, because you decide, you have to decide these things yeah. when you read them as a kid. And, and so that has bled into my life where I don't always know how to pronounce things because like, for example, when Megan and I, I graduated into this much fancier life where suddenly we're in five-star hotels in New York and Paris. And I'll say like, do you want me to call the bellman? And she'll say, honey, it's bellman <laughs> or things like that. Or, yeah. or it, where I'm like, uh, to this day, uh, the, the disparity in, in my, her sophistication and my lack <laughs> is, you know, it keeps things interesting where I'm like, honey, thank you. I, I'll probably say Bellman again next time, but please. <laughs> I'm the same way, but then I have the Southern accent on top of it all. Yeah. How do you say the C H E E T O S, the food? Cheetos. I say Cheetos. Cheetos. <laughs> I get people laugh at me for that. I mean, uh, th- th- I, w- I would shame those people. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep that on my phone to keep that audio clip on my phone. We're all just doing our best. There is a wonderful writer and performer 
that I really love and admire named John Hodgman. Really funny guy. He, he, I don't know if he still does it. He, he used to write an occasional piece in the New York Times, like a manners piece. Okay, nice. And he has a, he has a great podcast called Judge John Hodgman. Oh, cool. And he dispenses his listeners call in with feuds. And maybe it's between a couple siblings. It's like domestic things. Uh-huh. And he, he weighs them out and, and dispenses literal justice with a sense of humor. And he's so smart and funny. And one of the, and and he's a friend and, and colleague and and but I I mean I I'm such a fan of his and one of the things that I that I've stolen from him is that we all like so so maybe it's two siblings and and the brother wants to watch something stupid on TV and then she wants to watch The Bachelor or whatever and it's it's just the you know it's oil and water and and they fight or it's playing music or whatever it is yeah. And, you know, the the answer is, well, you both get to have an equal turn is the answer. Even if he's listening to, like, grunge, like, what, screamo yeah. metal yeah. or something. And he says, listen, you, we can't shame others for liking what they like. We have to be allowed to like what we like. Maybe it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Maybe it really is terrible. Like, you have to have the worst taste to like it. But it's your prerogative. And if it's your brother... And if it's a channel, then he has to get an equal turn. And if you can't stand it, then you may leave the room or you may put on headphones. Mm-hmm. But if if you want him to respect your thing, you know, and I, I mean, it, he, it's funny. It's a comedy. It's an erudite comedy show. It's on the um, Maximum Fun podcast channel. Okay. I'll check it out. We'll and, link to it. And it's, and it's really fun and funny, but it also makes me cry sometimes That's really- because it's because it's really he, he's really loving and he and he's really full of empathy i mean he's a really smart erudite guy who ha- happens to be hilarious and so i and it's those examples or in this book my two heroes that became my dear friends jeff tweedy and george saunders these are poets and troubadours of empathy they i am so moved by their work that is all that is also funny and and like rousing but they are these incredibly wise top talents who are trying to use their powers for good you know and with whatever i have in the toolbox from mother nature i take inspiration from people like this and say okay let me mix your ingredients into my goulash that i'm then going to try and serve to my audience I love it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do here, you know, is, is I'm trying to take all these lessons from people like you, ranchers, conservationists, historians, and then somehow, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of a selfish project because I'm trying to figure it out. It is, but we've come back around to answer your last question, which was about good work. And that's something I completely steal from Wendell Berry or, or have, have, you know, learned as a student of Wendell Berry is that it's, having the wherewithal to do what you've described and what, uh, what I've described. And that is look for good work that can be done. It's going to be so much more satisfying. You got you got to find a balance. You know, we have to be able to, to afford that grass fed beef, but at the same time, we don't have to be able to eat it with diamond forks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I've taken way too much of your time here and I could keep doing this, but I just, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time and invite me over and, um, let's be aspirational because I choose my projects by gut. I don't seek anything out. I don't say, okay, next year I want to do two movies and a book. Just what, I, like Sid Hartha, I see what's coming down the river and I'm like, oh, a sci fi series. Okay. <laughs> Love it. And so, but let's be aspirational. And it, in the list of possibilities now is coming to do some hiking with you. And let's knock some of that out. And then, you know, like every couple of years, maybe we can do this again. I would love it. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to keep reading your stuff, watching your stuff, admiring your woodwork. And good luck with your upcoming travel. I mean, I know it's nothing new having a packed schedule, but not that you need my approval or anything, but the world is a better place because of what you're doing and 
you know, what you're doing is very important, but, but how you do it, I think is, is the real important thing. And I'll never be an actor. Uh, maybe someday I'll be kind of a half ass woodworker, but I can apply these lessons that I've learned from you, both through conversation and through these books to my life. And so thank you. Seriously. I, I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do. And, uh, something I'd like to point out, when people to come check out OffermanWoodshop.com, I haven't made a dollar off of this company really ever. But I mean, I used to be solo. And so like I had the illusion yeah. of, of I would get I would get the profit <laughs> of, of each table. And it was before I began to kept, keep a, a ledger of overhead and things like rent and insurance. So I was like, great, I just made five grand. <laughs> But since I've started having employees, we, 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 we flirt with breaking even most of the time. But if you come to OffermanWoodshop.com, it's pretty great. There's lots of really fun stuff. Some of it's very expensive. Some of it's affordable. But right now at the moment, I have four woodworkers. And what you're supporting is them 100%. I, you know, I usually go a little bit in the red every year that I happily do because what we're all together trying to do is provide four people with a healthy living. The, you know, honest to God Americans making actual handcrafted wooden items. And so I, I just, I like to point that out to people because people have this weird thing where they're like, I want my thing made by the guy from TV. Mm -hmm. And a couple of my woodworkers are way better than me, first of all, because they're full-time woodworkers and I'm a dancing mountebank. Like I'm on your stage in your town. So they're actually there right now making the amazing stuff. So I thank everybody for their support. And I just always like to, it's so funny. I, I tell our clients, you get a little card that says, you know, thank you for supporting these honest to God Americans. And, and I, I try to convince people that the person whose name they don't know who actually made their three legged stool is way more charismatic <laughs> than the dipshit from TV. <laughs> so let's all just re remember that and keep that in our special place. Well, I'll have links to everything we discussed here and all the books we discussed. Plenty more to talk about. And if you're not going to call security on me, I would take you up on the offer to do some more stuff in the future. But really, man, thank you. This is great. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Ed. Hey, it's Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable. So it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread. So I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon, and there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prairie stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally, check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn, so look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support.